There is a level of subtlety and nuance to this film that for it being a film made in the midst of black exploitation, frankly. There it is. It 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 shows a level of confidence mm-hmm. and and a level of belief in this material mm-hmm. and frankly because it was a financial success yes I think it says more about the audience for black films in 1972 than they were given credit. Yeah, because this film only had a budget of a million dollars mm-hmm. and then went on to. Gained, uh, earned $17 million. Yeah. Young Junk! <laughs> Welcome to the Michelle Mission. Two men, one podcast, every black film ever made. My name is Vincent Williams, and I'm joined as always by my partner. Hey, what's up? Holla at your boy. This is Len, a.k.a. The Bat Tribble. And as we continue on the road to 400, we will spend time this evening with a bona fide American classic, the 1972 adaptation of William Armstrong's YA novel, Sounder, directed by Martin Ritt and starring Cicely Tyson and Paul Winfield and introducing Kevin Hooks. Mm Mm-hmm. But before we talk about Sounder, Lynn, how are you this evening? I am going out of my mind right now. Lynn, yeah. we are professionals. I'm trying to be professional. Vincent, you can't bring this up two minutes before the show I starts. I 100% can because that's the way this works. <laughs> now you're going to put it on the off-air cork board, and we'll <laughs> talk about it when we're off the air. Okay. I will try and do better. Yes. Um, I'm doing great, Vincent. Um, shout out to each and every one of you out there who are watching us at who's as we stream live from Young Junk, Philadelphia's premier video podcast palace, located right here in Maniunk, and we're streaming to you on Facebook, we're streaming to you on Twitter, and we're streaming to all of you right there on YouTube live. Hello, missionaries. Good evening, one and all. All right. Um, Make sure that while you're watching us, ladies and gentlemen, please, Tell a friend about the show. Tell them that we're on YouTube. Subscribe, like the video, hit that bell so you can be notified when we have new videos going up because that helps people, you know, find the show. We really appreciate that. Absolutely. All right? Absolutely. All right. Um, We've got a packed show tonight, so we're going to jump right into it with a quick shout out to the well-deserving winners at the most recent 2024 Academy Awards. Um, Cord Jefferson. Cord Jefferson. Won for Best Adapted Screenplay yes, sir. for American Fiction. Yes, a absolutely. Film that we absolutely adored. Absolutely adored. And Divine Joy, Joy Randolph won for Best Supporting Actress. Yes. In The Holdovers. Yes, yes. And and while she was excellent in The Holdovers, we have been fans of her since My Name is Dolomite. Amen. So, Amen. Yes, congratulations. Much, much congratulations mm-hmm. to, to both of them um, for winning. And you know what? I'm going to sh- send out another congratulations because while I would have loved to see Spider-Man uh, across the Spider-Verse. Sure win the best animated feature. Sure. The Boy and the Heron. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One, and that is an absolute beautiful film. I mean, yeah. And to, to, to close out the life and career mm-hmm. of Miyazaki, I I'm, couldn't have done any better. I that. saw someone from the Spider-Verse team said that if you have to lose. That's the one to lose. You to. know, you lose to the master. That's right. So, that's right. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, absolutely. So shout out to all of, all of them, ladies and gentlemen. And, and there is our Oscar chat. There is our Oscar chat. The great thing about Oscar is that they keep the black talk short. Real, real short. Real, real short. All right. All We're right. going to get into um, what you have to say, ladies and gentlemen. That means it is time for missives from the missionaries. So what right. else is going on, Lynn? We have... Emails, Vincent. Ooh, missives from the missionaries. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, missives from the 
Look at my Dylan being over there. Now I gotta look that way when he points to me. My whole thing with the screen is like one of them old people phones. Uh, the font is all big. Oh, oh yeah, because we got a monitor in front of right, us now, right. ladies and gentlemen. So you, we see, we see your names like big. So now I have to practice my discipline of not getting distracted which, by by the which is ticket tape going up for me anyway. Ooh, a squirrel. <laughs> I don't even know. I missed it. Oh, he gave us. He gave us. See, he's all the way and he's I in the know, dark. I, I can't. Know. I can't even see I Dylan. I know. I know. They're changing things up here at Young uh, Junk, no. ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead, go ahead. In real time. All mm -hmm. right. We got an email, Vincent. Uh, this one is from Terry Plain. Hey, Terry. The subject line, mm -hmm. missives need a redo and an apology. Oh. <clears throat> Dear Len. Okay. Keeping the innocence out of this. I was listening to the start of the last review of Hickey and Boggs, and when you started referencing the last top five with the top five brother bands. You are never going to live this down, and I say that's what you get. Didn't think much of it at first until you referenced Jagged Edge mm -hmm. at number five. Mm -hmm. I was driving and almost clutched imaginary pearls. Mm -hmm. Where I knew them as a brother's group, I didn't, or, not, or whether I knew them as a brother's group or not, I didn't. How in the world mm -hmm. did Jagged Edge mm -hmm. make anybody's top five? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I decided to end that episode and immediately go to the Blues Brothers review, which I hadn't <laughs> yet listened to. He made Terry stop listening to the review. <laughs> Stop it in the tracks. Just, just made him stop listening <laughs> to the review. As it started with honorable mention of Cool and the Gang, I patiently listened to Lens. <laughs> to patiently listen to Lens five of Jagged Edge and then number four of Bone Thugs and Harmony. <laughs> At this point, I'm thinking Len must have guzzled a gallon of Cafe Bustella and was just restless and needed to move his fingers on a keyboard because I was confused. When he got to number three as the Jackson Five, my head was spitting because at number three, Len is literally calling the Jacksons an American dream family the equivalent of mid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by definition, because see, see, Terry's doing math. If you have one <laughs> to five, I don't know if you picked that up or not, but three would be the average on the list. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. continue, Terry. <laughs> I would have called a seance to bring back Joe Jackson's ghost to haunt you eternally for speaking such blasphemy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. But then your number two was Jodeci. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't Jodeci. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. It was Casey it was and, Casey. and jo you, Right, right, right. I you, parsed it. You, the, you, you said Casey and JoJo's solo <laughs> career. <laughs> well, I said because they were the continuing act. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Anyway, Go ahead. Terry continues. <laughs> I remembered I needed to take my blood pressure medicine for the day because my ears started to ring at that point. I practiced my controlled breathing and held my breath until you listed number one. Earth went in fire. Okay. I let out an authentic sigh of release because, because you finally got something right finally. in this travesty of a list. Travesty. I believe this list deserves a redo by Vincent, who I could tell was holding his peace. You are so diplomatic, Vincent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I may or may not have had several conversations offline where I had to defend <laughs> your list. Hey man, everybody knows I ride for Mons. So I, look, I didn't make the list, but that's a show mission list. I stand by that list. My man's made the list. That's my man's. I rod with him. <clears throat> now for the one band, one sound. I appreciate. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. Now for the apology. Okay. 
I decided to go back to the Hickey and Boggs episode just to check through the names of Monday quarterback commentary on other suggested brother groups. After sobering up and getting help from the missives, the wrongs of the previous week were slowly getting righted. But there was still something missing, something that made me want to shout, something that made me wish a summer breeze could cool mm. my heated spirit, something that made, made me want to fight the power of anxiety mm. I felt when I thought about this egregious omission. How could you, Len, break this old heart of mine? Mm. Len, you know what you need to do, mm. but I understand if you don't, because it's your thing. Mm -hmm. Sincerely, that lady. Mm-hmm. Terry Plain. Right. It seems like if you don't fix it, you might hear footsteps, baby. In the dark. In the dark. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I acknowledge <laughs> that the Isley brothers. Mm-hmm. Have been on the list. Mm -hmm. There's an argument to be made that they should be on the list no lower than number two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who would be number one over the Isley? You could argue between whether or not you put them over Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right. And I'd say the argument would be, and I, here, I'll give you this. You're going to make me want to shout. I will give you this. Mm -hmm. I would put the Isley Brothers over Earth, Wind, and Fire mm -hmm. as a a better brother act mm -hmm. than Earth, Wind, and Fire because Earth, Wind, and Fire is really about the band sure. that just happens that they're brothers in it. Sure. As opposed to the Isley Brothers, it's like all brothers. It's right there in the name. So, I will... I will acquiesce mm -hmm. on that. You got to acquiesce? Say it with your chest. I said it with my I, chest. I know you did. Keep saying it. Because I said the Jacksons were Look, num number hey three. man, plant your flag. And they are. And now, I, in rewriting the, the list, mm -hmm. they are no longer number three. Mm -hmm. They are now number four. So so it's the Osleys, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and who else is over the Jacksons? Casey and JoJo. Yeah. I'm saying it with my chest. Look, all right. Thank you, Terry, for the letter. Terry, you know how to get in contact with us if you don't think that the solo <laughs> careers of Casey and JoJo. They're not solo careers. It's a duo. I'm sorry. The post jodice careers. No, I said no. No, no. Get it right. I said combined. Okay. The Jod Jodeci Plus, Casey and JoJo are a better career than the Jackson. So does that include the, the Jackson 5 and the Jacksons then? If, if it's Joe to see and Casey and JoJo, are you saying the Jackson 5 and the Jacksons? I'm just clarifying. No, oh, yes, I am. Okay. All right. You know how to reach us, Terry. Come on. <sighs> well, this will be continuing. Um <laughs> Didn't put out any fires there. George Cremona emailed us. Hey, what's up, George? Um, it was a subject line about Hickey and Boggs. Mm -hmm. Greetings, gents and missionaries. I missed last week's live show because I wanted to see the movie before your review. Mm -hmm. And I also took my mom and aunt to see Dune 2. Nice. To borrow a Vince phrase, this was such a bizarre movie with with its stripped down dialogue. The movie is filled with scenes where folks are just moving around in the scene. The Foley technician was working overtime to make up for the lack of dialogue. I had it on at work to have background noise, but the lack of talking forces you to watch what's happening in the scene. All this to say, I enjoyed the movie more as a near noir vehicle for the two. Mm. Just weird. Last, mm -hmm. if you had to remake this, Hickey and Boggs. Hickey and Boggs. As a Netflix show. Okay. Who would you paired up for this weird precursor to Lethal Weapon? Hickey and Boggs walks, walks so close. Uh, walked. Hickey and Boggs walked so that Riggs and Murtaugh could run. So who would you 
Uh, if you were doing this Hickey and Boggs as a Netflix series, and to be honest, not a bad idea. Well, uh, it just jumped in my mind. Michael Keaton and Delroy Linda. Ooh, I, the only reason I wouldn't say uh, that's not a bad pairing. Mm -hmm. The only reason I wouldn't do those two is I think you may want to do a little younger. No, I think they got to be older. I yeah, think but, I mean, but the, the both shit. of those are probably both of them are, are if not are close to their seventies. Yes, but I think two thousand twenty four seventy is equal to nineteen seventy two forty. I don't know about that. I think both of them could handle the physicality. No, the, no, no. How much physicality was in Hickey and? and there was, I mean, it's just a little bit of Hickey. And, uh, it was. It was. Uh, Bill Cosby chases a dude down on a football field. Did you watch? Um, oh, I just forgot the name of the show that was just on the Kerry Washington show with Delroy Linda. Oh, you. Rem going, I remember you told me about yeah, that show. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember the name of it. He's. He, he could be hickey. He could be hickey. Like, like again, this is not a this, this is not a, a Marvel movie jumping around, but you know, that little trot that Hickey does, mm -hmm. Del Orlando can handle that. I don't know. Hickey, I mean, he did more of a trot in the movie. To be fair, Bill Cosby chases the dude down in a football field. He gets his pen relays on. Yes. In a suit. I think Del Orlando could handle that level of physicality. And I mean, you know, I mean, look, it's going to be some stunt doubles and stuff. Okay. All right. Um, but, 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 but as a pairing. Right. Because I, I think you got to, you know, it's physical, physical performance. Mm. I, I think, you know, when you punch it up, it's going to be a little comedy underneath it. Mm -hmm. You got to have menace. You got to have. Camaraderie. I hear you. Yeah, so I hear you. that's not that, that's not bad. That's not who I would cast. Who would though. you cast? The person that, that I would cast, I would give everybody the reteaming that they want. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they want. Okay, and that would be and and older. Okay, Dominic West and Wendell Pierce, reuniting them from the wire. And putting them in Hickey. And yeah, see, I love Wendell Pierce as much as everybody else, but you're not going to tell me Wendell Pierce can be more physical than Delroy Lindo. No, he can't. But so, so you maybe have to switch it. Okay. So maybe, so maybe he's Hickey in name, but Boggs in character. Mm -hmm. You know, and and vice versa. But I would like to see those two now older, a little bit more grizzled. Sure. I think that they would. Sure. They could be great in that. I would not turn that down or turn that off. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, all right. So there you go, um, George. There's your thank you, George. There's your answer. I hope you like that because you have to important. tell me how your how the ladies in your life enjoyed Dune too. Yeah. All right. Uh, we got one uh, another email from Jason Hall. Hey, what's up, Jason? Hey guys, love the podcast. I just discovered it a few weeks ago and, and binging old episodes. Thank you. I'm curious if and when you're planning to review American fiction. I've seen it, loved it, and listened to a few all-white movie reviews of it, which are interesting, but can't wait to hear your take. Uh, American fiction will be coming uh, down the pike. I feel like it's a fall movie. Yeah. It feels fall. Yeah. We have opinions on American fiction. Uh, when it came out, we kind of gave a pre-review. Remember we talked about it oh, when we, did. we saw yeah, the, because we didn't saw want to the screening. Yeah. Knock off the, the box office. Short version, we liked it. Yes. A lot. A lot. A great deal. Mm -hmm. Corey P. wrote us. Hey, Corey. Hi, Len and Vince. From your fellow missionary, Corey, I've been listening to this podcast for a few months now, and I realized that while the mission is to review every black film ever made, mm -hmm. there's a question that you both may say has yet to be answered. What is a black film, or rather, what constitutes a black film? Since last month, you reviewed films like The Blues Brothers and Summer of Sam. I do have a question about these films that I'm going to mention. Do you consider these black films... Uh, some of these uh, have been asked before, Vincent, uh, mm -hmm. any given Sunday, which mm -hmm. with, is definitely, you know, you know, under consideration. Yeah. Yeah. Debatable. What about Rush Hour? I'm going to give Rush Hour all of those 
buddy films is is well appropriately enough because this month I'm my choice are buddy films. Mm-hmm. I'm giving them black film status. I think yeah, you yeah. do. I think we've we've proven that we've sure. done. You know, sure. and certainly, frankly, any of these buddy films made after Forty Eight Hours, and certainly Lethal Weapon. Mm-hmm. I think you have to um, you have to acknowledge how blackness plays a role in how they were made. You, you know, just to give her a preview, one of the things that fascinates me about Running Scared is that I feel like it's one of these cross-racial buddy films that is definitely before Lethal Weapon. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've off the top of my head, I don't know if it's before or after 48 Hours. I think it's after. But it certainly feels like a pre-48 Hours buddy film. Really? I feel, I feel like it feels like a post-48 uh, Hours film. I think Billy Crystal gives as good as he gets. Yeah, I think I think the dynamic of the 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 post forty eight hours black whatever combination is that the black guy is the wise cracking one, mm-hmm. and then the white guy has more of the straight man role, which is kind of what makes Lethal Weapon so subversive, right? Cause because because you you know, there. but even that is a reaction because it's like we're almost making a reverse. 48 hours with that dynamic. Yeah. And the thing about running scared is that both of them. They're kind of like on equal footing. And they have this wonderful yeah. kineticism yeah. where they bounce off of each other. Like they're actually yeah. kind of playing tennis. Yeah. Almost. And, and now that I think about it, it might be more that running scared is offering a grittier commentary on the cop shows of those of those time. Yeah, which Here have a lot go. of like teens. It, it feels a lot like more Starsky Star- and Hutch. I was just about to say it feels more like Starsky and Hutch yeah. than Forty Eight yeah. Hours. That's a good point. But that's for next week. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, Jason. We do preview reviews sometimes. <laughs> Email from Michael Lockett. Hey, what's up, Michael? Um, Lennon Vince. I just enjoyed listening to your critique and rewatching to serve with love. Mm. And I also listened and watched Hickey and Boggs for the first time to serve with love. I had kind of forgotten about in Portier's filmography. Captain America is a great description of his character in this very British film. (laughs) As a comics guy, when you mention Cap, it definitely connects and also made me think of a short question for you, too. Can you two think of a better character than Captain America for embodying an ever-changing idea? The many holders of this shield, uh, for example, Isaiah Bradley, Steve Rogers, Sam Wilson, Bucky Barnes, allow the telling of the complicated story of who is an American and what patriotism is Mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think other characters and ideas can do. Seeing Cosby in Hickey and Boggs blew my mind. This film also, although just so-so, does seem like it really opened people's eyes to what a gritty, imperfect cop-slash-detective movie could be. Undoubtedly, Portier and Cosby were stellar talents. I would argue that with his flaws out out for public consumption, Cosby was, or is, a better entertainer by a long shot over Portier, entertainer, not an actor. Thanks for another great pair of critiques. Michael. I, I um, resonate with him on the Captain America, um, using him as an analog for kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, displaying patriotism and what is an American, mm-hmm. you know, at a different time. Um, that is something that has... I've taken note of in my in and out with the Captain America series over the years. Mm-hmm. Captain America is definitely one of those comic books that I find myself every few years I return to because there's a run that is like really hitting me. Sure. You know? And I think that's one of the reasons why it's because it is okay. What commentary is he offering on America or the world today? as it is with this character. Right? Yeah, I yeah. I mean, that way. 
I think a perfect character is one that everyone can project onto Mm -hmm. and it still retains its its essence so like i think you can be red meat conservative and find a captain america that works for you but then as you said and and i'll just speak for you because i know your taste the ones that resonate with us Mm -hmm. are more about the ideal yeah and and certainly you have those is as well so i agree i'm i I also think Spider-Man is perfect. Like, I think Spider-Man is a perfect character for the same reasons. Yeah. And, you know, just to show my bias, I do think it's much more difficult to have a conservative kind of red meat read of Spider-Man. But in my mind, like, like that moment in speaking of the Spider-Verse, um, you know, enter the Spider-Verse where Stan Lee says, anybody can be Spider-Man mm-hmm. and you'll grow into it is, is my favorite, you, you know, like my favorite kind of runs of Spider-Man kind of embody that. It's kind of what makes Miles Morales work so much better mm-hmm. than these other versions of these characters that have so sort of, you know, these kind of substitute versions yeah. and stand-in versions. I think the concept of Spider-Man it was easy to have this young black Puerto Rican kid who is still, you know, Spider-Man. Right. So. All right. It, thank you. Thank you. That was Michael. That was Michael. Michael thank you, Michael. <clears throat> we also got an email from longtime missionary Robert Monroe Jr. Hey, what's up, Robert? Good morning, Len and Vince. I'm currently reading Horror Noir, Blacks in American Horror Movies from the 1890s to present. Nice. By Robin R. Means Coleman, and it got me thinking. Okay. What horror and science fiction movies would be seen completely differently if the main character was black? Okay. What if, for say, Klaatu from The Day the Earth Stood Still was a black man? Mm-hmm. What if Nancy Archer from Attack of the 50-Foot Woman was a black woman? Mm-hmm. How would these films be seen at the time and today? Wearing my Oscar Michelle shirt, as I do every Tuesday, Robert Monroe Jr. You know, by my read, we saw a version of Klaatu as a black man. B- um, a brother from another... Bro- uh, uh, brother John. Oh, Brother John. Brother John. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot. I I keep always forgetting about Brother John. Yeah, Yeah. Brother John. They actually say it in the film where where the one of one of the characters says to Sidney Poitier, it seems a little unfair that they would send they, you know, by my read, the aliens. Yeah. Would send someone to judge mankind who basically was a black man. Mm-hmm. Like, it seems like they're betting against us. And and the response is basically, yeah, but who better exactly to judge how humans are mm-hmm. than so-and-so? And as far as a 50-foot woman, I don't know about a 50-foot woman. I'm a leader. I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that I'm one. I'm not going to touch that I'm not going to touch touch what if that was the the attack of the 50-foot woman was a black woman. It was a black woman. (laughs) Ooh, we... I just say it would be the shortest horror movie of all. (laughs) It'd be shorter than Godzilla versus Bambi. Godzilla versus Bambi, yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, We have one more email, Vincent. Okay. Um, Oh, excuse me. We have two more. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, because it's been a while since we've read the email from Michael Sykes. So hey, Michael, here we go. Michael Sykes. I may not rap. I may not rhyme, but I know this moves, movie wasted all of my time. <laughs> oh, I know what he's talking about. After 50 <laughs> minutes of watching rapping, it made me take a napping. <laughs> Talk about a soulless movie. Not everybody, everyone can rap. <laughs> Why at the end of the movie they had the whole neighborhood rapping? The whole neighborhood was rapping. That's right. And the one guy was rapping country western, remember? <laughs> yeah, who? <laughs> Vincent attacking the snack attack song made me laugh so hard I choked and my whole side was hurting. Did y'all notice it had the We Got New Edition at Home version of their new edition? <laughs> 
Hey, Len. Oh, Melvin right. Van Peoples, Harry Belafonte, and Play from Kid and Play. Beetlejuice reference. By the way, Mario Van Peoples did more than trip over them dumb, dumbed down rhymes. He collapsed and fell into a coma. There is no snapping and clapping, watching, rapping. Love, Michael Sack. Y- yes. I contend that rapping to this day mm-hmm. is the worst film that we have watched. I still so think Soul Plane is worse. Oh. Oh. I do. No. I find Soul Plane offensive. Okay, Soul Plane is offensive. I, I'll give you that. Yeah, right? rapping is just dumb. But here's the thing. Soul Plane is offensive, but it's a competently made movie. And while you may find it offensive, there is an audience for that film mm-hmm. that, that enjoys that, that level of I mean, humor. I, get that, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure we talked about it at the time. There are people who like rapping. No, there isn't. You think they're all lying? No, there's no one that likes they rapping. They just don't exist? No one likes so rapping. So when you, when you look it up and people say, I enjoy rapping, you think those are like Russian bots? Yes. Trying to yes. destabilize our democracy. You, 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 boom. I figured it out. I you figured it out. Nobody likes rapping. Nobody likes rapping. Rapping is the worst movie that we have seen so far. It's not counting like, like super dumb, low budget movies or anything like that. Like there was a budget for rapping. I'm counting the super dumb, low budget movie. I think rapping is worse. Than- well, I can't say that because like... Because as bad as rapping is, there is Adios Amigos. Is rapping worse than Adios Amigos? Yeah. I mean, because on a whole. Ooh, that's a question right there. See? You see? See? And what was the other Fred Williamson movie? Oh, you mean the, um, the, the, Italian. the Italian one? <laughs> it's, it's worse than that Italian joint. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. See, it's, it's worse than that because at least I knew what it was. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right. But I know some amigos. Plus, plus they, they would play the soul music <laughs> when, when Fred Williamson came on. It was a whole movie of Italian white people. And then Fred Williamson would come on and go, it's a black guy. Look at the black guy. And we can't think of the name of it, ladies and gentlemen. It's not fair for us to be laughing. What's the name of that movie? We don't need to know. Okay. We don't even need to know. <laughs> we don't even need to know. We do have one more email that I wanted to share with you, Vincent. Okay. And this is from... Can the missionaries listen? They're here. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is from Feedspot. Have you ever heard of Feedspot? I have not. Feedspot is basically one of those websites that creates lists. Okay. Of different things, right? Okay. And then they they reach out to the people that they make the list of okay. to let them know, hey, we made this list of the top 10 fingernails and you're on it. Okay. Do you want to share this news with your audience okay. as a way of getting them out there? Sure, sure, sure. So what list are we on? <laughs> um, the founder of Feedspot would like us to know. Okay. That our podcast, The Me Show Mission, has been selected okay. as one of the top 80 two men podcasts on the web. Okay, I'll take that. Now, now, of course, we have the option of changing our name or profile pic on their list mm-hmm. so that it matches, you know, you sure, know. Sure, sure. Go in and, and, sure. and, and shout it out. Now, the top 80, weird number. Two men podcast. Okay. All right. We were not, we were nominated as one. Where do you think we fall in the ranking? 72. We are not at number 72. Okay. We are not at number 72. We actually, the Michelle mission comes in at. Oh, this is, oh, no, no. I think it was here. I thought we were at one number and we are actually, oh, there we go. We are number 23. Take that 24 through 80. <laughs> and number 22, we coming for that ass. <laughs> yes, number 22. How does one go up on the 
on the list? I don't know. Is I it don't... like trial by combat or? I'm not sure. I don't know how they, how they, how to. Like arm wrestling or. I don't know how often they update the list. We send them a check somehow. And something, 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 something tells me something we, is, we wanted to contribute exactly. to Feed Spot. We're contributing. <laughs> we <laughs> might be able to find our way up to number right, one, right. depending on the donation. The nice status you have there. It'd be a shame if you fell lower <laughs> on the list. They do, admittedly, they do have our old logo. Have so. our old <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, thank you, Feed Spot. Would you like to hear what is number twenty-two? Yeah, who? Yeah, who are we coming for? <laughs> number t- twenty-two is the Educated Idiots podcast. Mm-hmm. Two middle-aged white men. Mm-hmm. Racism with degrees in education and insights that make you question those degrees. All right. So we are we are coming for. That's right. Uh, we will give you a degree of questioning. I don't know. I'm, look, I'm just real time smack talk. I've never been really that good at smack talk. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what I'm. I'm spiraling over here, Lynn. I don't know. I don't know. Well, that is the emails, ladies and gentlemen. All right. And thank you, Feed Spot. We yes, appreciate thank it. You, Feed Spot. We appreciate. We appreciate, hey. appreciate everybody. Yeah, we really do. God bless. We really do. <laughs> it's like we really do. Thanks for listening. I don't know who left this comment, but somebody said Len just made me miss my turn mm-hmm. because I pushed the Jacksons down to you, number you, four. Yeah, look, man. <laughs> look. Look. Oh, that was Beth Brown. Look. <laughs> look, man. But, well, uh, you know uh, what? Let's go back. No, let's go back. No, let's go back to that question real quick. Oh. Go back to that question real quick. Because oh Terry goodness. Plain said that the list needs a redo. Oh. What would your list be? They said Vincent should should do should do a list. Osley Brothers, Jackson Five. Um, you would put the where would you put your whispers? Uh, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. If we're going to do Earth, Wind, and Fire, Odyssey. Um. I'd actually put the whispers because I think the whispers you think about them more as siblings than Sly's in the family stone and Jodeci at five. Okay. So you would have Jodeci at five. I'd have Jodeci at five. Which would include Casey and Jojo. No, no, I don't acknowledge Casey and Jojo. <laughs> you know why I don't acknowledge Casey and Jojo? Because no one acknowledges Casey and Jojo. They had heads. <laughs> Stop with this hit stuff. Like the head. Hammer had hits. Lots of people had hits. Can't nobody name a Casey and JoJo hit. That was it. Like it. Like w- when they did that that five dollar version of "If You Think You're Lonely Now." Is that Casey and JoJo or is that Jodeci? That was Casey and JoJo. Right. Exactly. Like nobody. That was a hit. It was a it was a hit because it was for a, a, a generation of people who had never actually heard Bobby Womack before. You put Jodeci at number five. I'm fine. Like, Jodeci is actually iconic. And I'm not a Jodeci fan, but, you know, respect where respect is due. That's right. Put respect on the name. I mean, I did. Okay. Like, I actually did. All right. So, can we move on now? I was Thank ready you. to move on. Thank you. It Man. is now time for the top five. Oh, boy. Top five. Who's the top five? <laughs> What's our top five? Oh, wait. My top five. I don't, I don't know. I, I got to look over. Oh, you yeah, see? I got to look over this way. And it looks weird on camera because I got to look this way. Top five, ladies and gentlemen, where I come up with a very passionate list. <laughs> and I give it to Vincent and obviously to you, too, yes, to, to add your commentary That's right. on. That's right. It's, it's a group effort. Tonight's top five, Vincent, mm-hmm. keeping it in theme. Always. As we are going to be reviewing from 1972, Sounder. Yes. This is top five Sounder likes. Films that Sounder like another movie. 
but they're not. Okay. <laughs> sure, Lynn. <laughs> I learn about this when y'all learn about this, folks. <laughs> this is not in the staff meeting. Number five. Number five. Hmm. From 2007. Mm-hmm. Ratatouing. 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 Marcel Tuing, that rat owner of the best restaurant in Rio de Janeiro, must embark on a series of missions to steal ingredients from human restaurants to ensure his meals remain the best. (laughs) Every Thursday night, Marcel goes on a mission with his assistant Carol and his friend Greg, the worst waiter in town, to search for rare ingredients that can only be found in restaurants owned by humans. They are faced with real dangers like rat traps and cat attacks. Their adventures get even more dangerous when a bunch of uh, jealous rats decide to get together to try and put an end to Ratatouille's culinary success. Ratatouille from 2007, not to be confused with Ratatouille by Pixar. Was this direct to video or you, you don't, I mean, you don't have to look it up. I'm just trying to figure out how Pixar didn't sue these people into oblivion. <laughs> It, would, it, it may have went directly to the video store. Okay, all right. But it was a thing. Uh, all right. Ratatouille. 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 Were you familiar with Ratatouille? Uh, I, I, not until this exact second. It's computer animated. Well, it would have to be, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, was, it was made with a Lego computer. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. It, number four. Number four. 2009, an mm-hmm. American science fiction film directed by Xavier Plusowski. Oh, okay. Starring Jeremy London, A. Martinez, and Paul Logan. The Terminators. The Terminators. The Terminators. It was released one month prior mm-hmm. to the premiere of the fourth film in the Terminator franchise, Terminator Salvation. This film is unrelated to the Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> franchise right right it takes place at an undetermined point in the future right right but i bet the future looks like a soundstage in canada (laughs) when 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 humanity has developed advanced robotic technology sure with enhanced artificial intelligence absolutely this includes the use of cybernetic organisms or cyborgs Mm. called (laughs) tr4s that's fantastic After being reprogrammed by the newest model, TR5, the machines instigate a cybernetic revolt against humanity, bombing cities and sending thousands of armed identical TR4 androids to eradicate all human life. Again, this sounds like somebody that should have got sued. But they were not. All jokes aside, you know, this was one of my favorite Types of movies in the eighties, but the, the like knockoffs, the, the knockoffs of the, of the, like, like the Mad Max knock. I, I probably saw way more Road Warrior knockoffs. Than well, there were a ton should. of them, and I watched all of them. I mean, I think there was a Fred Williamson Italian yeah. film that you made us watch. I, I think, which that, was I think that, absolutely, yeah. All Number right. three Number from twenty sixteen, another science fiction action film. Mm-hmm. Independence. <laughs> Day. Independence Day. Independence. Uh-huh. And what was this one about? Day. The alien Orions mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. attack the planet as humans are deemed too violent. Sure. <laughs> After blowing up many of the Earth's capital cities, they then heal many of the sick and offered to transport them, those who are hungry and others who wanted to go to another planet and many of the earthlings volunteered to go. Until they realized that to serve man is a cookbook. An Earth First militia forms to fight the aliens Mm -hmm. while the U.S. vice president, because the aliens have killed the president, negotiates with the aliens. The plot was noted to be very convoluted. (laughs) At any point, does the hero 
punch the bad guy and say, welcome to earth and keep my name out your mother. Sorry. No. Okay. All right. No, that all was right. not, that was not in the script. All right. Number two. Number two. From 2006. Jagged Edge. This was a. Sorry. This was a directed video action thriller horror film. Mm hmm. Also released by the producers of Independence Day <laughs> and the Terminators. Sure, sure. From the people who brought you Independence Day and the Terminators. Mm -hmm. Snakes on a train. Snakes on a train. In this film, a woman has been put under a Mayan curse. As one does. Which causes snake eggs to hatch inside her belly oh and eat their way out. In order to recover the lost pieces of herself, a.k.a. the snakes, she must travel to Los Angeles, sure. when it, where a powerful Mayan shaman can lift the curse. Because if you're a Mayan shaman, where else would you live but Los Angeles? She takes the snakes along with her in small jars. Okay. And while on the train, bandits attack her. Bandits? Allowing this. <laughs> bandits attack her. <laughs> They attack her, allowing the snakes to escape. From in the jars. Endangering the other passengers. Sure, sure. Eventually and inexplicably, she... Oh, this part her, is inexplicable. She herself transforms into a gigantic snake. I mean... And swallows the moving train whole. Oh, so she's a big snake. Six passengers manage to escape unharmed, and one of them performs a magic ritual, okay. <laughs> which causes her to vanish. However, however, one girl is shown to have been unknowingly bitten, suggesting that the curse will remain. Because the curse can can transfer transfer through 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 saliva a snake, through a snake bite. Yes, I'm sure at some point in this or film venom. they mentioned this, and we would call that foreshadowing. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Which is a, 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 a part of good storytelling. Sure, sure. Here's the thing. I'd 100% watch this. I would. The, the second they said she eats the whole train, mm. I have to find. Come on, man. You know they I, had me at Bandits. <laughs> yes. Because you're. You, I know you. You are picturing. Bandits literally with little oh, with, with, with the kerchief with the oh, kerchief exactly. around their face. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Pew, pew. Right. <laughs> Nobody make no moves, and this can all go smoothly. We can all get to our destinations peacefully and in one place. They're probably riding up on bicycles. Sure. Sure. Anyway, no. All right. Number one. Number one. In 2007, mm -hmm. <laughs> coincidentally enough, also from the producers of Snakes on a Train, mm -hmm. Independence Day, mm -hmm. and the Terminator. Terminators. 2007, Love at First Bite, AVH, Alien versus Hunter. Now, this is a very confusing title. <laughs> were you before you laugh at this obvious mm, knockoff mm -hmm. resemblance to Alien versus Predator? Mm -hmm. No matter who wins, we all lose. That was a tagline. This film stars Dee Dee Pfeiffer. Oh, okay. An actress of note. Uh, okay. And don't ask me to connect her to Derville Martin. The greatest American hero himself, William Cat. William Cat. Interesting. This film, like Alien and the Predator film franchise, deals with a suburban community being threatened by a fight between two warring extraterrestrial beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scott Foy of Dread Central gives it 0 0.5 out of 5 stars. Okay. And calls it neither fun, nor exciting, nor scary, nor even so bad that it's good. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's um and the author, Arthur Brian Sen, calls the film utterly dismal in every respect. Okay. All right. 
Now you say D.D. Pfeiffer is a actor of some note. Yes. What, what, what was she, is this a, a man or a woman? Is it a woman? What would she have been in that I knew her from? What would you have known her in? She was looking her up now. You said it with your chest, like who, no. Who well, do you remember? Her? Do you remember when Sybil Shepherd had a short run um, sitcom called Sybil? I do. She I played know. her daughter. Okay, all right. And she also show starred in another short run sitcom, not right after that, called For Your Love. That's uh, the one with Holly Robinson Pete. Uh, for Your Love starred Holly Robinson Pete. Right, right. And Dee Dee Pfeiffer was in there. Okay. So there you go. You there have you, seen. There you, there you go. You have seen. Dee Asked Pfeiffer. and answered. And she was the star of Love at First Bite, ABH, Alien versus Hunter. Now, was it Love at First Bite colon? No, it's Love at First Bite, AVH, colon, colon, Alien versus Hunter. Alien versus Hunter. Okay. All right. I don't make them, I don't title these films. Sure, 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 I sure. I merely read them. Just, 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 you just report the news. I just report these. Okay. Top five sounder likes. All right. Well, there you go. There you go. I do like a knockoff movie. I don't. I know. I've yet to see a knockoff movie that I have. No. That's not fair. I did, what was that? Um, there was a knockoff of... I think at least two of Jean-Claude Van Damme's early movies are Terminator knockoffs. And they're both quite enjoyable. What? The, the it's one like where Cyborg, he's Cyborg. And then there's another one called like something close to Terminator. And I enjoyed both of those. Mm. And now that I'm thinking about it, the one I was about to say that I, I like it wasn't really a knockoff. It was more, it was a spoof. And okay. That's not a, that's not a knockoff. Right. Right. Um, cause I think there was, a, there was a, cause I liked the, the first scary movie. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Well, that's the top five. It's top five. Ladies and gentlemen. I don't. Well done. I don't see this one. Uh, I think, I think you're, I think you're good. I think we're good on this one. I think you're good. Thank you. All right. But we'll see. You, you know what? <laughs> Something about that top five sounder like Lynn. You owe an apology. <laughs> All right. All right. Let us now continue mm -hmm. with Six Degrees of Derville Martin. Right. The Game of Kings! Game of Kings. Should look at you and then you should signal me when you get wait. Wait, do you have your fingers up? <laughs> Are you counting down? Oh. Alright, go. <laughs> I didn't know if he had his fingers up and was counting me down. Alright, well, all right, go ahead. We'll work this out. It's all real time folks. Six degrees of Durville Martin. <laughs> Six Degrees of Derville Martin, ladies and gentlemen, where I give Vincent two actors and he has six films or less to connect them with Derville Martin, who sounds like nobody else. That's right. There's no sounder like for Derville Martin. Vincent. Yes. Keeping in theme. Okay. We are reviewing Sounder. We are. Tonight, which stars Cicely Tyson mm -hmm. and one Paul Winfield. Yeah, yeah. Connect Derville Martin to these two actors who also share the same initials as Paul Winfield, oh. E.W. Okay, all right. Interesting. All right, what we got? Number one in six films or less, connect okay. Derville Martin to mm -hmm. Patrick Wilson. You have seen Patrick Wilson. Can I, can I see his picture? I can't see his picture? That's cheating looking at his picture. Oh, Ocean Master. Is he, any, is he in anything else besides Aquaman? Yes, he's been in, every, he's in tons of things besides uh, Aquaman. He didn't just step on is a scene. Is there anything I would, would, would use besides, would I know him anywhere? I'm, look, I'm looking through, through his IMDb. I mean, I'll get to Aquaman, but now I'm just sort of curious. Because he is familiar. Yeah, he is. He's a really familiar looking guy. Mm, looking through his IMDb, what films did I 
think you have seen him in. I, oh, there's a big one. There's a, there's a huge movie that I, I fairly certain you have seen him in. I can't say for certain, but I'm. Oh, pretty... I'm going to use Aquaman, so just tell me. Okay. Watchmen. You know, I didn't watch the Watchmen movie. Really? It was garbage. It's not. It's not. We're garbage. not having this conversation again. We have this conversation, I swear, once a year where you try me try to convince me that Watchmen and Zack Snyder missed the didn't miss the entire point of Watchmen. No, I didn't say that he didn't miss the entire point of Watchmen. I'm just saying that it's not garbage. It it's garbage. Oh, oh, right. Cause he's right, because he's is he buff cut up night owl? He's not buff cut up night owl. He is night owl. But he's not buff and cut up. He's not. Okay, that guy plays Night Owl right there shows that they completely. He, but he gets to, I mean, it's a totally different body type. I mean, that's 2009. The Aquaman is not till 10 years later. Dervil Martin is in Five on the Black Hand Side with Dick Anthony Williams. Mm -hmm. Dick Anthony Wil Williams is in Mo Better Blues with Cinda Williams. Mm hmm. Cinder Williams is in One False Move with Michael Beach. And Michael Beach is in Aquaman with Patrick Wilson. Very good. Yes. Very good, Vincent. Yes. I'm just saying, I'm just saying the, the Watchmen is not horrible. Cord uh, Jefferson wrote the um, Hooded Justice episode mm -hmm. of Watchmen. Yes, he did. So. A, a television show that understood watching and is better than the movie. I'm not knocking, mm -hmm. knocking you. No, not it's better. Actually, read the material and understood it. Vincent, I'm like I hear Zack Snyder talking about things now, and I have to say, with all due respect to Zack Snyder, I'm wondering can he actually read? Like, has anyone checked to see if he's not just looking at the pictures? Like, you know, comic books are a visual medium, and oftentimes you can kind of glean what's happening by looking at the pictures. But, you know, like I heard him this week talking about Batman, and I was like... What did he say? Oh, well, Batman, people saying Batman shouldn't kill people. That's That doesn't make any sense, and Batman should kill people. And I'm like, Zack Snyder can't read. Like, is anyone checking he read? I mean, there's an argument. There is an argument to be made. But then he's not Batman. Okay. Like, that's like saying Batman should wear a funny hat. Oh, well, I mean, if he has a sombrero on, he's still Batman. I mean, why can't he wear a sombrero? I th First of all, I, do, I think that Batman can, could kill. I'm not saying, like, randomly, just serial killer, kill, kill, kill. But I think Batman, you could have Batman kill kill someone and he still be Batman at his core. This is someone who has never recovered from watching his parents die in front of him. That is very true. So at his core, mm -hmm. the tragedy and sadness of Batman is that he wants to get to a point where there is no more Batman, mm -hmm. but he's never going to get to that point because for there to be no more Batman, that means nobody dies. He doesn't want anyone to die. No, yeah, I understand that. So the Batman who kills people is now not Batman. Yeah, see, who's next on the list? I'm not talking, well, I'm not going to eat up Tom talking about this dumbass Watchmen movie where again- Well, now we're I, on an interesting right. Batman conversation. Well, I mean, I'm just talking about Zack Snyder. Like, I don't know if he can read. Like, now I need Zack Snyder. I need someone to hand him- a piece of paper and have him read it out loud on video. Read. I need him. I need them to do like they did Phyllis Wheatley and them white men surrounded her and made her write a poem in front of them because the they proof. thought she was an abolitionist hoax. Yes. I now think that Zack Snyder is an abolitionist host, a hoax. That the North the Northern agitators have put up because they don't understand slavery. That's what I think Zack Snyder is. This is taking a turn. I'm just saying. <laughs> he was, he was toxic. Maybe, maybe he can't read. 
Does anyone know Zack Snyder can read? He just looks at the pictures. I'm going to continue. Okay, who's next on the list? In six fil films or less, mm -hmm. connect Durville Martin mm -hmm. to Paul Williams. <laughs> well, you know I love Paul Williams. You know I love little Paul Williams. Oh, man, how am I going to get to Paul Williams? Because you, you, you know exactly where I'm going with Paul Williams. I know Williams. exactly where I'm you're only going. going one place with I'm Paul Williams. One place. I'm only going one place with that little yes. man with the suit on, and he's standing next to Daddy. Daddy, and they both have on their suits. And this, okay, here we're going to get to Paul Williams. So Dervo Martin is in, um, guess who's coming to dinner? Mm -hmm. With Sidney Poitier. Mm-hmm. Sidney Poitier is in Paris Blues mm -hmm. with Paul Newman. Mm -hmm. Paul Newman is in The Sting mm -hmm. with Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason is not in. Is Jackie Gleason in with Paul Newman? It's not The no, Sting. No, not The Sting. No, it is The Sting. It's not The Sting. How is it not The Sting? What is because it? it is not The Sting. What is it? Not The Hustler. Lynn, it is the sting. It's not the sting. What is it? What is he in with Paul Newman? It's not the sting. What is the name of the movie? It is called. Um, it is the hustler. I can. I'm I can. Sure, it's the sting. No, it is not the sting. The sting is one of my top ten favorite Look movies. It up. It's not the sting. I'm telling you, it's not. Look the it up. Uh. Yeah, The Hustler. It's not The Sting. No, it's The Hustler. Okay, he's in The Hustler with Jackie Gleason. And then Jackie Gleason is, of course, in Smoking the Bandit with Paul Williams. Very good. Very good. All right. Is Paul Williams in anything else on in movies? Yeah. Besides Smokey and the Bandit? Yeah. What else is Paul Williams in? I used to love Paul Williams. Uh, he's in a, probably, a, definitely a movie that I, th I think you've seen. He was in Smokey and the Bandits in 1977, mm -hmm. of course. In 1979, he is a featured cameo in the Muppet movie. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Of course. He Rainbow also, Connection. also has a cameo in The Muppet Christmas Carol. Mm. But I'm surprised, Vincent, mm -hmm. that you do not go back to Paul Williams to 1973, where Paul Williams appears in battle for the planet of the Apes. Who was he in battle the for? Apes. Paul Williams in Battle for the Planet of the Apes is Virgil. I'll be damned. He sure is Virgil. I forgot all about that. Mm -hmm. Of course, how do I get to battle? Who's in battle? Um, well, I mean, well, Roddy, I mean, Roddy McDowell. Roddy McDowell is probably the only one. Right? Or Claude Akins. Yeah, I would never get to Claude Akins. But you'd probably Aiken. never yeah. get to Claude Akins. Right, so I'd have to bounce to Charlton Heston in Planet mm -hmm. to get to Roddy McDowell, and then Roddy McDowell links me to the rest of them. That's very loud. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. I forgot he was Virgil. Mm -hmm. That's a good pull. Yeah. But I always think I'm in, the, in that little suit next to the other dude. Yes, next yeah. to uh, Patrick, Pat McCann. Okay, all right, excellent. All right, there you go. All right, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is it. What's wrong? Because the chat always distracts me. Sharon, I'm telling you, it's too big. And Sharon Eldridge is asking me, are you sure, Len, about the sting? Yes, I'm sure. He's not in the sting. Okay. He's not in the sting. That The sting is... Paul Newman, Robert Redford, and uh, Robert, not Vaughn, um, but the the guy who who then is McQuaid in Jaws. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah 
Those are the stars. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Then it's time for us to get into our review. Yes. Of Sounder. Sounder, a 1972 American drama directed by Martin Ritt and adapted by Lon Elder from the 1969 novel of the same name by William Armstrong, Mm -hmm. concerns an African-American sharecropper family in the Deep South who struggle with economic and personal hardships, specifically food insecurity (laughs) during the Great Depression. It stars Cicely Tyson, Paul Winfield, and introduces Kevin Hooks. The sound, sounder from 1972 was the choice of Lynn Webb. Lynn, I believe this was your first time watching Sounder. What would you like to say about this film? This was my first time seeing the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a film that I've always, I've heard, has been heralded for years. Mm-hmm. as like this American classic. Um, but I think because of its setting, knowing that it was dealing with sharecroppers back in the depression, mm-hmm. you know, my immediately immediate thought was like, Ugh, I don't know if I'm ready for, for this film. I've got to be in a certain mindset before I sit down and watch this movie. No doubt. And it is one of those films that an exercise such as this podcast was made for, for me, mm-hmm. because it forces me to sit down and watch the movie and give it its just due. And so sitting down to this for this film, I was prepared to be like, all right, I'm gonna be in my sad bag. I got my tissues next to me. <laughs> sure. You know, um, I'm cutting off all, <laughs> all like contact with all of the white people in my life because oh, y'all might catch some hands real quick. Well, Taj Mahal is playing that sad music. You know, <laughs> you know, everybody's walking with nobody got no shoes. <laughs> I'm like, man, do, do, they, do, the kids only got one shirt between them. One shirt. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Every, every, clo- every stitch of clothing has like multiple patches that have been patched up. Like the... The one, the one Kevin Hooks and young Kevin Hooks introduced in this film, his whole arm is damn near a patch. The whole sleeve is a patch. I was like, yo, all right, uh, let me just get ready. Cecily Tyson is sweaty as hell in this movie. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me get ready for this film. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I learned that, and then the other telltale sign that this may be a tearjerker is that I learn when it comes on, you know, it says, you know, sounder. And then I hear, I see Paul Winfield, Kevin Hooks walking across the field, and I hear a dog, and they're like, here's sounder. I'm like, oh, the dog's name, sounder. Oh, oh my God, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Somebody gonna shoot sounder. Sounder. Yeah. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, dude, I am ready. I'm yeah. just, oh, I'm, yeah, no doubt. I am ready for it. Mm hmm. But then a funny thing happened on the way to sound mm. in watching this movie that <clears throat> for those who haven't seen this movie is a family drama. You mm-hmm. know, they, they are sharecroppers. They are poor, mm-hmm. but they are very much that is who they are, but they are living their life. Mm-hmm. They have their structure that is built into their life that, you know, Dad and Paul Winfield and this young son, Kevin Hook, uh, young Kevin Hooks, they go hunting for possums at night. Mm-hmm. You know, apparently this must be the best tasting possum ever because they chase this possum across all of the South. They were just hungry. <laughs> well, well, true that yeah. too. Yes, because this uh, this was the this was going to be the meat of the day. Yeah. Um. But this is their routine, right? Mm-hmm. And then they come, they come back home. They and you know, mom does wash to make a couple of pennies. You know, that's how she makes a little bit of extra money. Mm-hmm. And dad is, and they're sharecroppers, and they they don't get the possum. They go to bed. The kids are basically they eat, but it's like you get the idea that it's pretty much just like some cornmeal or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 
and dad gets up in the middle of the night, yo, I got to do what I got to do. And then eventually you you learn that he went and stole some food for them. Yes. You wake up, and there's, there's sausages, there's meat. And it's like, oh, that's meat, that's meat on a pot. What, yeah. What's going on? And dad's, you know, hey, I did what I had to do. Mm-hmm. But he right. gets caught. He has to go to prison. He has to go to jail. Hard labor for a year. Mm-hmm. And then the movie is about how the family, okay, this this is what it is. You're going to be here. We're going to get through. We're going to survive. And it is all about the survival of this family. Mm-hmm. And in their finding their way through what life is presenting to them. Um, and, and even with along that way, still finding a way to be positive, to be a family that is in love, that is united, um, and also to progress in whatever way they can, specifically in their older boy, Kevin Hooks, Kevin Hooks character, um, as he develops a relationship with a school teacher mm-hmm. as he goes off in search of his father in, in this uh, prison camp. And as I'm watching this movie, as much of there is the implied uh, political agenda of the sta- of the day, the the racism, mm-hmm. the 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 class system between blacks and whites in this film, um, it it is all there in the movie, but it is, the movie is not about that. Mm-hmm. The movie is about living and just living day to day within that world. Right. And what does that look like? And how can you do that without letting it beat you down and tear you apart? Um, and this movie shows how you do that because it's the way that we have been doing it for, for years. Mm-hmm. Day by day, inch by inch, minute by minute. Uh, that is what that is what is on the screen in this movie. And in doing so, I think it presents a heretofore for me, uh, an almost unseen view of blackness on screen. And I can imagine totally unseen by in 1972 mm-hmm. um, at that point, looking at the films that came before, because it doesn't linger on any of the outside, you know, stuff that is coming at them, the racism mm-hmm. or anything. Nothing pulls this family apart from one another. Um, nothing pulls them from their mission. Their mission is to, is to stay solid, to stay together, to keep thriving as much as they can until their father comes home. And, you know, spoiler for a 50 something year old movie, they do. Right. Um, This movie features not one, but two Academy Award nominated performances. Mm -hmm. Paul Winfield as as, as the father, Cicely Tyson as the mother. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if you, we had a conversation um, not long ago. As a matter of fact, it was uh, the missionary, uh, Lisa Alexander, was asking us about uh, syllabus for films that depict, you know, about black women Mm -hmm. in the 70s. -hmm. While this film is not set in the 70s, it is made in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I would contend that this is one of the most positive and progressive and authentic depictions of a black woman and, and, uh, and mother and wife on screen in maybe, the, maybe ever. Mm-hmm. Because Cecily Tyson's character, Rebecca. Rebecca, that's right. Is a devoted mother. Mm-hmm. She is a fully formed um, uh, wife, Mm -hmm. loving wife. Mm -hmm. She is a 
black woman who takes no mess, mm -hmm. cuts no corners, hardworking, mm -hmm. um, diligent, beautiful, mm -hmm. strong, um, thriving, and magnificently portrayed on screen by Cecily Tyson. Mm -hmm. There's a scene, there's a homecoming scene, a famous homecoming scene of the father where Cecily Tyson runs from the house mm -hmm. to Paul Winfield limping his way up, up the road. And I can imagine there was not a dry eye in the audience when that scene hits the screen, nor should anybody be sitting in their seat. Right. Because you should be just standing up and clapping. And it, it, is, it is such a triumphant, beautiful moment in this film. Um, I was found myself complete, completely mesmerized by this movie. Martin Ritt, who is a director of profound note, he he crafts a movie that puts you right in that time. Yeah, you he, he I felt so much that I was, and I felt in that time without it being oppressive. Mm -hmm. It just felt like I was just transported back to that time, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, to the depression down south, and and as much as the, the racism is there. It's not over the top. It's not people just, you know, like N word here and would get out of my face, you know, all this stuff. Like, um, the white the the white characters that in this film are not shown to be monsters. Mm -hmm. They're shown to be racist, mm -hmm. but they're not shown to be monsters. They and I think in doing so. That just helps again with the authenticity of this film and the moment in which it's presenting mm -hmm. and the story that it's presenting. It actually boggled my mind that this is based on a YA novel because this is such a mature piece of work. Right? Yeah. Um, and then for this film, as uh, Kevin Hook's character, you know, he develops this relationship with with a teacher, and it really is just strictly a relationship of him just wanting to learn, yeah, and wanting to learn more about himself because in, in her and in her classroom, like he, you, you see him in a classroom earlier where he's one of three black children in a classroom that's filled with white children, right, right, and you you hear through context of the of the film that you know the sheriff pulled some strings to get him into that class so that he could learn and he's basically learning you know you know education a la colonizers right but when he develops this relationship with this black teacher yeah. who is teaching a room full of black black students and is teaching them you know Teaching them, you know, uh, 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 giving them an education, but that that but is that is definitely from a black lens and a mm -hmm. black point of view, um, stoked in blackness coming from black voices. He realizes, oh, this is where I really want to be. Right. This is why I want I want want to learn. And without it being any type of argument or anything like that, the the parents are like, you know, well then that's where you're going to be. Right. It's 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 not this foe like you know like oh no you can't go away from us or anything you got to run away no it's it's just real it's just one hundred percent real man and the whole time I'm watching it you know for those who don't know in the seventies there was a show there was a TV show it's a huge huge success successful TV show called The Wall. And it was basically about a white family mm -hmm. coming up like this huge white family that lived in around these same times. I, if I remember, they weren't in the South. They were kind of like maybe like Midwest or I something like that. I feel like, like you that. were Midwest maybe. Right. But, um, but, but it was a huge success. The, mm -hmm. the Waltons ran for like about 10, 12 years on, on TV. I would have loved to see founder of the TV series. Sure. Never mind the sequel that is done in 1976 that we will not speak of. We won't. Um, but that none of the main participants of this film had anything to do with it, which is why we won't speak of it. Mm -hmm. 
But I would have loved to see Sounder, the television series, because I just would have wanted to return to this family. Yeah. I just fell in love with this family. I fell in love with the dynamic. I fell in love that, you know, uh, the mother and father, they were deeply in love. Yeah. They oh, were one hundred percent in love. They 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 shared knowing glances with one another. You see them walking off arm in arm and in, in, in love with one another. The kids were, you know, w- while there are two younger kids who aren't fully formed as characters in the movie, but they you feel that they are there, they're integral, they don't lose sight of them in the movie. No, they're no. right there. Mm-mm. I mean, there was I just really watched this movie just thinking like, wow, this is, I can see why this film in 2021 was elected to the Library Library of Congress as one of the most culturally, aesthetically uh, relevant films of the 20th century. I can see why Cecily Tyson and Paul Winfield in a smaller role was mm-hmm. still nominated for yeah. Best Actor. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. And her for Best Actress. I get, totally see why they they were nominated you could totally also totally see ladies and gentlemen if you only know cecily tyson from tyler perry movies this is why cecily tyson is the cecily tyson right this is the movie where where you know she she cracked the code and show y'all how to do it um and i could totally see why sounder is a film that people keep returning to Mm -hmm. because even though it is from 1972 even though it is set in the depression it is a film that wears very well um that you can watch even now in 2024 and be totally captivated and mesmerized i absolutely love it yeah yeah I, i think you know i'll pick up where you ended about it that's relevance I have to say, I always group this film with the learning tree. Yes, you do. Them. You, you know, and and I forgot talking about you know this depiction of this family, and 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 just how it kind of unfolds in this real naturalistic manner, mm-hmm. where frankly there isn't really a plot like this is a film that as you mentioned Paul Winfield's character Nathan Lee steals food Mm -hmm. because his family is is hungry and then when he's arrested for it everything just sort of disassembles yeah because there's no mystery there's no mystery as you said there's no you, you know, the racism is all systemic. Mm-hmm. You, you know, no one is. That's, is, the, that's the good word. You, you know, yeah, no yeah. one like there are no personalities. Right. That are, you, you know, we very much. And, and speaking of it being relevant, like you absolutely see the kind of dynamic of how poor people and uh, specifically poor black people mm-hmm. were kind of funneled into this chain gang system to provide free labor Mm -hmm. because it's all right there on screen. Like there's no big statement about it, but it's, it's, it's clear that between the sharecropping and again, these very limited choices, these poor people are funneled into this system. And then the characters just sort of operate in this setting yeah and i agree with you the direction i i love the the direction of this film just for its sense of place you know Mm. filmed on on location in louisiana Mm -hmm. and martin ritt very much utilizes this 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 sort of um rural setting the whole landscape the landscape everything and you get these beautiful wide shots of these rolling fields and these trees and everything. But, you know, I I do have to say, while I agree with you uh, about how how good this film is, I do think 90%, like this film is on the shoulders of these three performances. Yeah. Paul Winfield and Cicely Tyson put on 
an acting clinic for almost two hours with how actors can utilize their whole bodies. Mm -hmm. Because so much of what you see between Nathan Lee and Rebecca is on their faces yeah. and these knowing looks and these exchanges. Uh, I, we were talking about this earlier. This is one of, you know, this is perhaps my favorite Cicely Tyson performance. And, and, and I'm a little biased because, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of these black, women performances where they do everything where, you know, I'm a mother and a wife and a this and mm -hmm. that. And I think the way this Rebecca is very subtly sexualized, very subtle. Yes. And as you said, this is a couple, but this is not a chaste couple mm -mm. like Nathan Lee and Rebecca desire each other. And it's not a 70s love scene and this, but you know, there are these wonderful moments when they're in each other's arms or, or there's, there's a moment where, where Nathan Lee comes back after a year and he's been in prison mm -hmm. and, and they all eat to get, they all eat dinner together. And then at the end of dinner, Rebecca says, well, kids, I think it's time for you to go to bed. Mm -hmm. And the two of them exchange a glance that is Every, All you need. You know exactly what the subtext you know what time is, it is between these two. Uh, Cicely Tyson is a one, you know, this Rebecca is a wonderful mother. I love her relationship with Kevin Hooks' David Lee. Mm -hmm. And and there's this love, there's this, there's this com, com, camaraderie. There's a moment of mischief when David Lee says, you know, this teacher has said that, she wants me to come and stay with her during the school year. And, and you see, again, it's all on her face where Rebecca kind of does the math, realizes this is for the best, makes a decision all in a split second mm -hmm. that David has to go. But then she has this little moment of mischief where she says, well, David, I don't, I don't know who's going to help me around here if you go. Right. And then, you know, she breaks and says, of course, you can go. But as good as Kevin, as good as Cicely Tyson and uh, Paul, Winfield. Paul Winfield are, Kevin Hooks, in his first role mm -hmm. as a child, mm -hmm. is so good. With those big soulful eyes, His big soulful eyes. I I think just his actual performance. I think his his bearing, mm -hmm. his presence. In the, you know, a lot of scenes, at, at one point, you know, actually at two points, Kevin Hooks has to go travel to see his father, mm -hmm. but he's by himself. So there are extended sequences where it's just Kevin Hooks and this dog, Sounder, Sounder. and Kevin Hooks does a wonderful job so that... Much like you, I, I, you know, and I really enjoy this film, but I think today what I admired was this level of craft in the acting of these three actors mm. and how they, you know, again, in a film where there isn't a lot of plot, frankly, there's not a whole lot of dialogue. No, there are long patches, especially when you're with David Lee right. on his journey. You realize that what you're really watching is this kind of character study between these three actors. And, and you know, speaking of, you, you know, just plot wise, I thought it was such a kind of masterful move that when Nathan is arrested, you get this this kind of shifting point of view mm -hmm. where where you you come in and you think that it's all going to be from Kevin Hooks's character David's point of view you know it's him he's a kid this is the dog you kind of say okay well this is going to be a rite of passage and this that and the other but then when they split the family up yeah from scene to scene everyone gets a moment to kind of you see their perspective you, you know back to Cicely Tyson, who now has to hold this whole thing together. 
she has these two wonderful moments where she's in the store and she's kind of, you know, she's got to halfway eat the shit from the shopkeeper who's saying about David, about the, their you know, credit and all this credit stuff. Credit and this, that, and the other. But as you said, she, she bends, but she doesn't break. Nope. And then the moment where they actually bring in the crops mm-hmm. because they have to handle the the farming without David, they, they, Nathan. Nathan Lee. And it's the same thing where, where you can see, as you said, the racism isn't personal, but it's absolutely systemic. Mm-hmm. And this woman has to, you know, operate within this. Yep. And Cicely Tyson embodies this wonderfully paul um paul winfield's nathan lee you know i I always forget that when he comes back from jail there's still almost a half hour of movie left so you get to see the toll that this is taken on him like this isn't he runs into her arms and then it's a happy ending and then the credits roll no, it's like no. There are repercussions. Yeah, because he this. had a hard labor for a, a year. Right, right, and and how the family dynamic has changed a little bit, mm-hmm. and it's handled sensitively. Mm-hmm. It is not sensationalized. Like 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 you absolutely get the sense that that he's got to figure out how to fit into this new Where dynamic he is now. Yeah, especially considering because his body is letting yeah. him down. But but there is a level of subtlety and nuance to this film that for it being a film made in the midst of black exploitation frankly there it is it 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 shows a level of confidence mm-hmm. and and a level of belief in this material mm-hmm. and frankly because it was a financial success yes i think it says more about the audience for black films in 1972 than they were given credit. Yeah, because this film only had a budget of a million dollars and then went on to gain, uh, earn $17 million. Yeah. Which in 1972, ladies and gentlemen, is a very good number, a great great number for this smaller film. And when you consider that was only a million dollars to cost, that's 17, (laughs) you are happy. I was about to say in 2020, if you hand me, um, if if I hand you a million dollars, and you hand me back seventeen million dollars. We all win. Right, right. Somewhere Tyler Perry is crying a thug tear. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So this was a uh, movie was a a huge success, especially like you pointed out that it's a bit of counter programming mm-hmm. the films that are uh, uh, that are really hitting. The theaters at this time oh, in yeah, 1972, 72. and oh, like yeah. this is this is when they're hitting it hard. People mm-hmm. are like, "Oh my, you know they they're running to the to the theater for Shaft and all these other films." But this film, this film is uh, making its mark, making itself be known, and I think it's because one, it is the film that you could take the whole family to. Yeah, you, one thing, yeah, other thing you got to remember: 1972, the movies was a night out. Yeah, it was it was it was you go out. It's Friday. Let's go to a movie. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there, this is a movie that you can take the entire family to to watch. Um, you would take the entire family to see any kind of movie you're going. But it's a, like it's a movie. Right. you should take the entire family. You took, to. And, and to be fair, in 1972, you could take the entire family to see this. This would be the first film. Right. And then right. there would be another film. Next, we're going to watch The Exorcist. I see. I, I told you that story. I told you that story yes. where my family took us to see Dumbo, that's, that's right, right and then it was the Exorcist. I saw Jaws. I saw Jaws. <laughs> we do it. So you know it happens. Yeah, this is just just uh like an amazing piece of work, man. And and to think that it it um one of the things I pointed there was a a di- a, a, a line of dialogue that I mean, oh my god. First of all. I couldn't find information about this. Yeah. I can't believe that this film was co-produced by Mattel. <laughs> a toy company. I did not know that. A t- Mattel Productions. Does it say why? 
I couldn't find information about why. Were they trying to dip their toe in the movies, maybe? Uh, was there a, is there a sounder playset that oh I don't know goodness, about? I hope so. Uh, no. Now I want to look at Now you want to see if my... there's a... Like, what was the sounder merchandising? <laughs> we should probably say this, because I know people are wondering. The dog does get shot. He does. But... He does not die. I know many of us are scarred from Old Yellow. Never saw Old Yellow. Never saw Old Yellow. Old Yellow doesn't. Doesn't make it. Don't care. Okay. Oh, it's real sad. I'm sure it's not. Oh, it's real sad. Really? It really is. Because he's like, he protects a kid from like, I think a bear or something. And he gets rabies. <laughs> Oh my God, why are you laughing at Old Yellow? What is, you a sociopath? No, I thought you were going to say like he protects the kid from, no. from, 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 from the bear. No. And then the, but the bear, he right. dies no, in protecting no, the no, kid. No, no, I, no. He protects him and then he gets rabies? Right, I think from the bear or the wolf or like something. But he got tag teamed? Whatever, it, you know what? <laughs> you said a bear and a wolf? I don't know if it's a bear or a wolf or some kind of animal. Maybe it was a raccoon, but somehow old yellow he gets rabies. He died from rabies. a raccoon? A he raccoon died. took the dog out? He gets rabies. And then the little boy got rabies too? Got to kill old yellow. Because, you know, when an animal gets rabies, it gets all crazy. So you got to put him down. Right. Was old yellow foaming at the mouth? I believe so. Now, in full disclosure, I think I've seen Old Yellow once, cause, and I was like a kid. Are there any, any black people in Old Yellow? There are not. We're not going to do Old Yellow. But when you see Sounder, you think, you, you, you know, like, 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 you know little Kevin Hooks is going to have a rite of passage. And, you you're know, thinking the, the, right, right, the today I'm no longer a boy, I'm a man. And right. you're going to assume As that. As he buries his dog. Right. But no. Right. Oh, yellow got rabies? Yeah, oh he died yeah. Got rabies? Oh yeah. And the boy no, had to no, kill him. He, no. he, he died, died from, from a bullet. bullet. <laughs> <laughs> that is terrible. Now you've got me doing it. <laughs> Structurally though, all jokes aside, that is kind of fascinating that David has this rite of passage into manhood and there is no great tragedy there's no great there's no great tragedy there's no like love interest you know right. or anything like that but but like you assume somebody's gonna get lynched somebody's gonna die you know they're gonna have to kill the dog like something's gonna happen that at the end again i'm no longer a boy i'm a man see but that's what makes this film as transformative as it is yeah. as especially in 1972, because there's none of that. No. Like you said, as far as like the plot, outside of him going to prison and you having to wait for him to get home, mm -hmm. that's really the stakes in this film. Yeah. And as you see them, you know, learn to toil the land without him, there's not even a lot of drama in how they do that. It it very much is just like, okay, well, Monday, we got to do this. Right. Cut to Tuesday, where we got to do this again. What well, a funny thing is, you know, not to pull at the strings, you know, I understand you have to do, make these moves to get the plot moving. Like, I got the sense that they really were destitute for him to go and steal this meat at the beginning. Yeah, the, you, but that's like the only moment in the film where you get the sense that there's some food insecurity. It's, it's like the old adage. Yeah, you yeah. may not get what you want, but you'll get enough of what you have. Yeah, see, because it's not, that's the one, I guess, like you say, yeah, it's a threat you, if you pull on it. Right. You know, there's not a lot of setting up of what leads him to leave in the middle of the night to steal essentially meat right. because they've got food, but the, 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 to put some protein on, on, on the plate, that's what the possum was going to, to be. Right. And then you maybe, you know, you extrapolate from that, like, okay, um, 
they chase this possum all over the the the, the entire south because this was like the last piece of meat right for miles they right. they had eaten they'd eaten everything else everything else right and uh but you know and apparently there was no creek with no fish you know what i was thinking the exact i was like god damn why don't you go fishing because when he's chasing the possum the whole time he's chasing nathan lee and david lee attention the possum in the beginning of this film he's got like this this satchel o- o- across his body da- right. nathan lee that looks like it is filled with stuff so i'm thinking he's they're, they're, they're after the last catch of the day. Right. And he's got the other catchers or maybe fish right. in there. No, a- apparently he's got his, his walk, man. I don't know right. what, what he's got in there. Right. You never learn. So so there that's not really set up as 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 well as it could be. But again, the performances are so strong. Yeah. And, and you don't story, even care. And the story gives you enough. Right, right. And 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 you're there, and there's no mystery of it. It's like, you know, we found this food that he stole. And he's like, yeah, well, they got me. <laughs> well, yeah, they got you. They got a big-ass ham in their hands. <laughs> we went in your house, and then we got this ham, the ham that has my name. It's like, it's Mr. My name. It's like Mr. Jenkins smoked ham. <laughs> wow, you're... You bring the ham in the house, like hide it over on the shed or something. See, what is not said is that he cut an eye at at Rebecca. Like you were supposed to cook that. This morning. Supposed to cook that this morning. <laughs> supposed to get it. We were going to supposed to eat the evidence. Yeah, you know I man. Yeah. Just around the sausage. You're yeah. Supposed yeah, to cook the ham. Yeah, the ham. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it goes without saying. Oh. The question is, of course, would you recommend Sounder? I would wholeheartedly recommend Sounder. I would recommend you to see Sounder. If you haven't watched Sounder, watch Sounder. Mm -hmm. If you haven't watched Sounder in a long time, watch it again. Introduce it to your family. Sit down with your family and watch Sounder. Introduce this to to young people. Um, this is one of those films that like definitely should be introduced to young people um, because it is a window into a time, a period of time, as well as just a beautiful family um, relationship on screen. Uh, and it's also a member of Paul Win- Paul Winfield, an actor who, mm-hmm. despite yeah. the, the nomination that he receives for this film, I don't think gets his just due as an actor. I, I 100% agree. You know, didn't get, you know, for one reason or another, didn't get the opportunities that probably he should have. Um, but so you can remember him. Cecily Tyson, she's out. Her name still rings out. Um, but this is definitely an opportunity to return to her one of her, if not her, greatest performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kevin Hooks, another name who found who found his way to television mostly, yeah, and then directing on the side, yeah. Um, but you know, definitely a name if you are a fan of '70s movies and television, a name that a lot of people are familiar with, and this is where he gets his start. Um, Founder is definitely a movie I would recommend. You, you, you know, go see it, please. I agree. I agree. I, I do think my um, a little bit of my disdain for these period pieces. These, you know, I, you know, I call them the barefoot dirt road movies. Is, Not a lot of shoes in this movie. Is because this film and the Learning Tree. Mm-hmm. Like I think they 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 did what they do so well Mm -hmm. where i was from a very early age like well i have what i need yeah from from the from from the two of them from from these two films is all i need yeah because even if you wanted a little bit your drama a little bit you know more plot more more plot yeah then you've got the learning tree sure you know sure but uh much like you i think paul winfield has never gotten the level of acclaim that he should have I, i feel like you know, frankly, he was eclipsed by James Earl Jones for a lot of his career. Um, and Lou Gossett comes up around Lou Gossett's time. right there behind him. Uh, Cecily Tyson, um, I think for the legend of Cecily Tyson, frankly, 
if you look at her body of work, the examples of why we hold her to such high esteem are not as many as you would think. I know, I know. And this, this, this is absolutely the the, the number one example of mm-hmm. of why Cecily Tyson is Cecily Tyson. Much like you, a big fan of Kevin Hooks, and and I actually like Kevin Hooks, young actor. Yeah. And this is a great example of it. And and this is a film that, you know, much like Paul Winfield, I feel like has kind of gotten a little lost. I, I I think when we talk about 70s films, oh yeah, we tend to go bombastic. Yep. But even when we do quote unquote counter programming with 70s films, it's still bombastic. We talk about Claudine. We we talk about the Cosby. Po- 48 movies. The Kazi 48 movie. We talk about Sparkle to a certain extent. And even then when we go family, because we're so... The problem is that when we go 70s, we either go bombastic or we go urban. Because Mm -hmm. even when we talk about family, we go to five on the black hand side. Right. You know? Yeah. And frankly, I think when we go these sort of rural period pieces... Even in that very specific subsection, the learning tree eclipses this. Yeah, and, and I think that's just because of the drama of the learning tree. Sure, sure. It's more dra- it's more dramatic, it's more, more right. melodramatic. It's, it's, it's more going on. Yeah. It's just actually more happening in the learning tree. Mm-hmm. So this is a quieter of a movie. So I so I do think this is a film that many people have heard of, perhaps, but haven't actually watched. Uh, and, and I very much I very much recommend this. Definitely. But don't take our word for it, ladies and gentlemen. Go and check it out. Sounder. Mm-hmm. The dog lives. The dog lives. The dog lives. Which, you know, all jokes aside, I feel like that may have kept a few people from it. Like, I'm not trying to watch no dog die. And when you look at the trailer and when you look at the poster, I mean, you it said does it yourself. It, it does, you yeah. said it yourself. When you saw that the name of the film was Sounder and that Sounder was the dog, I mean, he was knew. like, oh, my goodness. I've written this. I've seen this movie. Oh, my goodness. That is very true. I hope that dog didn't put down no deposit on no house thinking that he's going to make money off of the sequels. They're going to keep making Sounder like they made the Thin Man movies. And like the Thin Man's only in the first one. That's not true. Oh well, yeah, because yeah, right. that's right. Because the thin man right. is, is technically like, is why actually. Why do I have to tell you this? You know this. Well, I had to remember. Uh, yeah. Because I'm getting out of my thin man bag. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to go in on the thin man. I mean, it's true, right? The thin man. No, it is, is the true. mystery in the first. He's the mystery in the in first, first one, movie. and then he more or less becomes the detective, even though he's not ever called the thin man. But you more or less see that it was just Nick and Nora. No, it is Nick and Nora Charles. You know, so the rest of the it, it, it is. But the reason why they are still called the Thin Man is because the films when they come on, they have it's always like a like a cartoonish figure, yeah. and that cartoonish figure after the first one. It's, as you see the way he's stylized, he's more or less stylized as Nick is in the movie. So, so Nick becomes a thin man. More or less a thin man, even though he's never called oh, the, the thin, thin man. man. So that's what it's I'm like saying. It's like Doctor Who. What do you mean like Doctor Who? Like no one ever calls Doctor Who Doctor Who. Oh. He's the doctor. They don't? I never knew that. Yeah. I never knew that. Not a Doctor Who guy? Not really, no. It, I've tried. You don't I have just... to hesitate. It's a taste. It's a taste. Yeah, it's 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 a taste. I like Jagged Edge, though. <laughs> That's what I hear. <laughs> That's what I hear. Who's better, Jagged Edge or Doctor Who? Next week. <laughs> on the Michelle Mission, I'll tell you what we're going to be watching in just a minute. But before we do... If you're in the Philadelphia area, ladies and gentlemen, and you like seeing me and Vince talk about movies, (laughs) where do you hear us talk about sex? That's right. This Friday, here in Philadelphia at Comedy Sports Philly, Vincent 
and I, the Michelle Mission, will be the guests on the DTF Fun Hour. Daryl and Tim Marie Fun Hour, the liveliest, funnest sex chat game show ever. And Vincent and I will be right there this Friday. Comedy Sports Philly. Look it up on the internet. Tickets on sale right now. We're going to be live in person. We're going to get it on. Yeah. Yeah. I got my red shirt ready. Always with the costumes and the dress. I just had a red shirt. All right. All right. Are you going to wear a red shirt? No. Probably not. Probably not. No. <laughs> You know, you know, that is my line in the sand with everything. I know. Uh, Trekkie. Yes. Comic fan. Yes. Whatever. I go uh, 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 Dungeons and Dragons role playing games. I'll go all the way to the point where someone says we should dress up and do fill in the blank. And I said, this is my stop. Let me pull the chain. Ching, ching. How about we tr used to play Dungeon Dragon? Then you Dungeon Dragon, and then white boys will go in the woods and dress up. Like, uh, I'm good. Well, the second they said go in the woods, if it was a rap. I mean, what's the difference between going in the woods and putting that ass on your head and say, I'm a Klingon, and then you go see the movies in the movies, or, or you put on, you know, Captain IP Man, and you put on an outfit and you go to Comic Con, and, you know, like people dress up. Mm hmm. It's not my thing. It's not your thing. I just get, it's, it's my stop. I understand, I understand. Let's try this one though, ladies and gentlemen. Because also next week, next Wednesday, mm -hmm. the Michelle Mission will be presenting the inaugural Be Real Michelle screening series film Pariah mm -hmm. at Bryn Mawr Film Institute, Wednesday, March 20th in partnership with the Be Real Black Cinema Club, our good friend Stephanie. Hey, Stephanie, and Bryn Mawr Film Institute, presented by the League of Historic American American Historic Theaters. Yes. The Michelle Mission will be, be presenting a screening of Pariah, one of my favorite films of all time, mm -hmm. as well as uh, hosting a talk back afterwards. We're going to have free pretzels for everyone. Yes. We're going to have giveaways for everyone. Mm -hmm. And Vincent promised, not me, but Stephanie, that, what? that we would go to the event in black to make it an evening out. Yes. You did agree to that. Look, I got all kinds of black clothes. Vincent. It's an evening out. We we agreed to be dressed. We agreed to be dressed, right, right. you know, a little, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. No khakis, Vincent. I mean, you know. No, I know. No khakis. I'm, look, I'll be there. You have to come out and see. Tickets are on sale now at Bryn Mawr Film. Dot org. Pariah. Pariah. Be Real Me Show screening series. And you have to come, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're not there, you won't be able to vote on the next film in the series. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Want to make your vote count? You got to show up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Be a good time. It will. If you want to email Vincent and I and let us know what is on your mind, email us at michellemission at gmail.com. That is M-I-C-H-E-A-U-X-M-I-S-S-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also find the Michelle Mission on the social media of your choice, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, at Michelle Mission. You can also find us where you're watching us right now, on YouTube, at Michelle Mission, where you can hit the bell, subscribe, so you're notified when we have new videos going up, and we can build up our subscribers, because the more subscribers we, we build, the better we do in the algorithms, and the more people find our show, and the more people find our show, the more successful we will be. Even though we like where we are right now. I'll tell you the truth. We, we coming for you, number 22. We coming for you.
22. We're going to have to just choose somebody from the list every every week that we're coming for. We're coming for yeah. 22. All right? All right. The show mission is also a proud member of The Podglomerate. Thepodglomerate.com. They make podcasts work, such as ours, which is filmed every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. here at Young Junk, Philadelphia's premier video podcast palace in Maniunk. And if you want to book your time in one of the fabulous studios here in Young Junk, email our man Dylan. He's over there now. Our man Dylan at youngjunk.com. That's D-Y-L-A-N at youngjunk.com. All right. Right. Next week here on the Me Show Mission, ladies and gentlemen, it's Vincent's turn. It is. And he already kind of told you what we're going to be watching. It. And it is a movie that is near and dear to both our hearts. It, it is. Because we enjoy it. And not just for the Billy Crystal of it all, but primarily because of the Gregory Hines. Yeah. It is the 80s fun-filled cop action comedy. Mm-hmm. Running scared. Running scared. Next week here on the Michaud Mission. Until then, he's Vincent. I'm Len. And in parting, we say. We'll see you when it's time to meet again. Young Junk!